Hi, this is Bill Kennedy with the Arden Labs podcast. And today our special guest is Guinevere Sanger. Did I say that right? Sanger? Uh, yeah, there's actually another way to say it. Where I grew up, you'd say Zenga. 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 Uh, but I guess I kind of jumped that surprise on you. So I usually go by Sanger. Hey, <laughs> good morning, afternoon. Yeah, you're on the West Coast, right? You're around, are you in California or? Uh, Seattle, actually. So it's a usual Seattle winter day here, rainy and gray and waiting for spring, you know. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to get back to Seattle when everything opens up. I love that city. Oh, uh, what's your favorite part about Seattle? I love downtown Seattle. I love just being able to walk around and have access to everything and Obviously, the, there are very cool coffee shops. Yeah. So it's a cool yeah. vibe. It's I miss cool going vibe. to coffee shops. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you say I miss downtown Seattle. Um, I miss downtown Seattle, too. Oh, that's a bummer. Bummer. Okay, so on this podcast, we talk to our guests and try to get a general sense of um, kind of how they started with computers and in, in the industry uh, leading up to where they are now. So I, I, we, we ask every guest to kind of take two minutes to let the audience know uh, like what you're doing now, where you work, what you're doing now, um, just so we can get a stage of where we're going to be heading over the next hour. Yeah, absolutely. So um, currently I am on the development lifecycle greater team at GitHub. Um, specifically, my smaller team built out deployment platform automation for every developer at GitHub. So I'm an internal facing team. We do refer to our users as customers, but they are um, all of the other folks at GitHub itself, not people who use the website externally um, or, you know, our enterprise customers either. So you're developing internal software tooling for the internal engineering team? Uh, all of the internal engineering teams, yes. Um, and our scope is widening as the company is growing. Um, so it's, uh, it's exciting and it's tricky and it's a challenge. Um, and yeah, it's, it's also really it's a good challenge. Like it's a fun challenge. It's it's not a frustrating challenge most of the time. Is the challenge coming from the technical side or is it coming from trying to meet the demands of pretty probably demanding engineers who need this tooling? Like where where where's the challenge come from? Um it's really funny that you should ask that because um, as usual, the long answer is it's complicated, um, <laughs> or, well, I guess that's a short answer. Um, <laughs> um, it's a mix of both, right? We definitely sit at the intersection of here's what the computers can do, and here's what we need people to do or what we expect people can do. Um, so as a platform, our aim is to abstract away the computer's needs to a degree that it is easy for the humans to use the computers. Um, so ultimately, the idea is, is that deploying should be minimally difficult. Um, Has any of the tooling that you've ever built ended up being used outside or made public? Or I have to imagine that what you're building could be potentially used by others as well. Yeah, I get asked that question a lot, um, especially because uh, GitHub's external, um, uh, GitHub's, the website runs on Kubernetes. And I'm fairly active in the Kubernetes community, or at least I have been before 2020 hit like a meteorite. Um, but uh, it's some of it. Some of it is really, really bespoke, um, and other parts have, in fact, already been open sourced. There is a little repo called Cube Service Exporter that um, mostly my team at the time built, and I 
did a couple of demos on, I think about two years ago by now. And in a nutshell, what Cube Service Exporter does, it uh, it allows you to bring your own load balancer to a multi-cluster multi architecture. Wow, uh, that's one of the big words. Um, <laughs> But it's it's just a tiny piece of software that uses a key value store to um, abstract away networking services, um, so that you can you don't have to worry about running a huge bloated Kubernetes cluster for all of your services that you then have to update as new versions keep coming out over and over and over. Um, so a way that we run or used to run Kubernetes at GitHub uh, was to just deprecate old clusters and migrate things over using the, this kind of service. Um, yeah, it's out there, check it out, Kube Service Exporter. Um, I am no longer on the maintainer list because again, we've grown a lot um, and I focus more on platform and less on infrastructure these days, but who knows, we might go back. <laughs> No, so you're really in the thick of this whole Kubernetes running, using Kubernetes to run these production environments. Like you're really in the thick of that, right? Like mm -hmm. that's amazing. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's really great. So, how long have you been? How long have you been a professional developer? Just so we, can, I, I can get some time frames here. How long have you been in the industry? Um, let me think about that. It's I think. Ooh. Oh gosh, uh, four years. Four years. Yeah, four years come this February. As a person running and building things at a job with computers, yes. <laughs> That's amazing. So is this your first job in the space with, with GitHub? Uh, no, GitHub is my second full-time job. I was at um, Samsung's Samsung SDS cloud native computing team for a year and a half before that. Okay, perfect. So we're going to get back to all of this. Awesome. There's so, so much more I want to talk to you about here. But my, my favorite question to ask every guest is what is your first memory of working on a computer? And try to give me a general sense of maybe how old you were, or kind of what year we're also talking. Uh, okay, so uh, this is me officially dating myself <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps also giving a wrong impression. Um, so my first memory working on a computer, oh gosh, I was, I think, eight years old. And bear with me here. Um, and my dad got a new computer which was already really rare because this was 1988. And um, I think my dad was tired of using a typewriter basically, which is why he got a new computer. And I got the old Commodore 64, um, like really old. It didn't, it had like a green and black monitor and a book called Programming in Basic. And I remember playing around with that right up until my sister discovered that there was a whole box of floppy disks filled with games in my dad's cabinet and we stole it and the joystick which apparently just came as part of the set i don't even <laughs> i don't even know because this is very unlike my dad um and that kind of was the end of it but I do remember writing some really basic like you know print statements and hello worlds and basic and um, I think when I was 10 11 or 12 the computer broke and I never got another one and I never touched computers again not from a not until college just from a user perspective I didn't even use them until college 1999 uh yeah, and then I didn't really do any programming until a few years ago when a friend offered to teach me some Python. All right, so let's let's get back to there because I think you're calling your dad out for being a gamer back <laughs> when you were eight years old, and you're like, "Oh my God, my dad was a gamer." He, had, <laughs> he was hiding. Is that is that what's happening here? Look at dad. I don't think so. <laughs> dad is a very serious 
classicist with a degree in ancient Greek. He would never be caught dead playing computer games. I think you needed to challenge him. I think you should have challenged him in a couple of games and saw what happened. I genuinely have no idea and until you ask this question. Um, I never thought about it, and I will have to go challenge him on a few of my previous oh, assumptions. Yeah, you know what? You need to, we got to get it back in the show somehow. When, when, <laughs> you, when you question your dad about his gaming back, what year, you said you were eight years old. What year again was that? That was 19... 1988. 88, 88. Okay. Great. Per so, so I we need to get a report back about how your dad was a, a gamer back in 1988, <laughs> hiding all those games. That's awesome. Okay, so you said something interesting here because you were you were uh, writing some basic programs, which is the first programming language that I learned. It's a, for me, it's a great learning language. Um, but then you, you you found your your dad's uh, video games, and then you and your sister. That's it. That's all you were doing at that point. Now you're gaming. Yep. Um, and it kind of took over. And then all through, I would say, junior high school and high school, you're not thinking about this. So, so I'm interested in high school, which let's say we're now talking. You said you graduated in '99. Mm-hmm. That's right. right. So nine, nine, eight, nine, seven. So, so around 1996, you're a freshman in high school. What, what are you interested in uh, as you enter high school and go through high school? If it's not tech. Um, so this is this is a, a little bit more complicated. Um, I went to high school in Germany, and that meant that high school started in grade five, and went all the way through grade thirteen. Um, <laughs> They, okay. had, they had at the time, and I still think they do, they had a tiered education system where like the more it's, I have opinions about this, but the more academically oriented uh, people were actually sorted by their teachers into different schools, um, like more trade oriented schools and more academically oriented schools in grade, like after grade four. So it was basically just elementary school and high school. Um, and at the time we had a computer lab. I remember this, I think in seventh or eighth grade, we had a computer lab and there were classes in it and they started, I think in grade eight or nine, but they were afternoon extracurricular classes. You were not required to take them. And I distinctly remember my math teacher saying like, hey, why don't you sign up for programming class? And I was like, well, I, I don't know. And then I went back home and talked to my parents about it. And this is where I kind of don't know about my dad and the gaming thing, because they said, oh, are you going to learn how to touch type in this computer class? And I said, no. <laughs> um, I asked and they said no. And my parents said, well, then it's useless. <laughs> so I took French instead. Um, <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I, I remember another of my teachers was really, she asked me, hey, why aren't you taking computers? And I said, well, I don't know. I didn't want to give them my parents dumb reason about typing. No one cared about typing. All of our papers were handwritten. Like nobody typed anything ever. So I... I just said, well, it seems like it's a class for boys. And I remember she was disappointed in me. <laughs> uh, and you're 13 at this time? So you're, you're 13, 14, 15, somewhere around there. Yeah. Wow. Okay. What, and what there do weren't you think, any boys in that class. So. Yeah. Why do you think that, what, what do you think gave you the impression that that was for boys? Just because there were more boys in the class? They were literally only boys in that class. That was, that was it. I, especially at that age, I did not want to be in a class full of boys. Yeah, yeah at 13, I can, yeah, yeah no, no, I, I can appreciate that. <laughs> but you're talking about being in what, I guess, in the U.S. equivalent to eighth or ninth grade at, at 13. Yeah, yeah. Which would normally be around 15 here. Um, right. I, I genuinely I guess don't remember. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just trying to. 11, 12, 7, 13 is 8th grade, 14, ninth grade, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you graduate high school at what age then? You're like, if you're 14, 15, you're graduating high school? Yeah, I was, ni I had, 
I was 18 when I graduated, but most people are 19. Okay. So I, I, so, I'm a summer kid. <laughs> gotcha. So you, computers was not your track. You didn't want to be in that room full of boys. You decided to take French um, in that particular case. But, but what other interests did you have then through high school? What, what was it that, you know, what was it that you were doing that you thought maybe could have been your career? Um, so I was the music kid. Um, I, I was also really, yeah, I, I mean, I was the music kid. I was in choir. I was in orchestra. I was in like, uh, early morning recorder group. I was that, that. I, I took piano lessons, um, and I had basically made up my mind at age 12 that I was going to be a professional pianist. And um, so everything I did had something or some relation to that. Um, and that's what I wound up doing in college. Um, my parents, again, tried to convince me to take some uh, science or, yeah, they didn't want me to become, uh, they didn't want me to study like um, language because that's what they did. And they decided that, um, that, that that wouldn't make me happy for some reason. Um, my parents are both high school teachers and they didn't want me to become a teacher. Um, and I kind of didn't want to become a teacher either. So I attempted studying chemistry for a year and really didn't like it. Um, so I switched to piano and I got a degree in piano and this is, oh, I'm sorry. I moved to the States and went to a United States college. My dad is American. So I, that's when I moved to the States. Um, <laughs> I should have mentioned that. Um, yeah, so I got a degree in music and I funnily wound up becoming a teacher after all, because that's what you do when you're a musician and have to pay the rent. Um, <laughs> All right, so let me let me get the timeline right. So you, you're graduating high school in Germany. What what year are we talking now? We're we're talking ninety nine, I think you said. And then the decision is you're gonna go to university for music. Yep. But you're gonna do that in the States. Yes. And your parents are still gonna be living in Germany because they're teaching there. Yeah. And your parents are totally cool with you going to the States to go to university for music. They're 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 good with that. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so my parents had planned for me to study in the States because they both believed that the universities here are better, which is really interesting and funny. But they also didn't realize how much tuition had risen in price um, from when they went to college, also partly in the States. Um, and the main reason why I agreed was because... Um, at an American university, it is possible to double major. And that is really hard at German universities. Um, not only that, but music schools are usually different. And so I decided that in order to like, you know, maybe keep my options open and appease my parents, I would start out with the chemistry major and also study piano at the same time. And sure, move to the States because I'm 19 and why not? Um, <laughs> so that's interesting. See, see, that's interesting, right? Right, Because your parents wanted you to pursue a more academic career. You wanted music. And so you kind of found that back door into now. What can you tell us what university you ended up going to that had both a music program and um, I guess, you know, a science program at the same time? Um, I went to the University of Oregon. Okay. I'm a duck. Yeah, that's... Ah, oh, nice. Yeah, that's a great college to be at for um, athletics. So, now, did your parents have any idea that you were thinking about this minor, quote-unquote, music? <laughs> they did. They, they said it was totally fine for me to study music as long as I studied something else as well. Um. So the upshot was that by year two, I realized that I didn't really like chemistry, didn't like where that was headed. Lab reports took forever. Um, I didn't get a lot of support in the science program either. It was not, it just didn't 
really capture me the same as music school did. Um, and so I quietly dropped the science major and did not tell my parents who were, mm. after all, paying my tuition. <laughs> and so for your second year in university, you decided to just go hedge down, full out music. That's right. But they are eventually going to find out because they're going to look at your report card and they're going to see what classes you're taking. I mean, <laughs> um, eventually I just kind of, I don't know. It, it was fairly uneventful. Um, I just told them, I'm like, hey, by the way, I, uh, I'm no longer a chemistry major. And I kind of managed to blame it on the program a bit, being like, you know, I think I just didn't get the right types of classes and the right kinds of support. And I feel much more supported doing this music thing, um, which ultimately probably wasn't true. <laughs> but that's what I wanted at the time. OK. And they were, at that point, they're OK with it. You're you're there. Yeah. So you you end up finishing this music degree. Yep. Right. So 2002, maybe around 2002, you finished your music degree. You now have a degree that allows you to, I guess, go into teaching, right? Was that was that your plan the whole time, or was it to try to play professionally? I wanted to play professionally all along, and a music degree is not an education degree, and um, the way that teaching works is you give individual lessons, right? You start a studio, you start a little business, you go have students, they you either go to their house, they come to your house. Um, there is much more to it than that. You know, you have to run um, uh, conferences, competitions uh, for your students, concerts, events, stuff like that, um, which is all like really cool and super rewarding. Like seeing that little five-year-old grow into a 12-year-old that can play amazing music is just, it's, it's really great. It's, it's really rewarding. Um, it's also really hard and um, you deal with a lot of, like it's, it's got all of the downsides of being in the service industry, right? You have to deal with people's feelings and emotions and their, and their needs and like they're specifically hiring you for your time. So you have to kind of cater to that. Um, I moved to L.A. right after getting my degree and um, attempted to become a performing classical musician, which uh, sort of succeeded. And like I got gigs, I, uh, I decided that I was going to be a collaborative pianist, which means that I'm a professional accompanist. So I work with other musicians and support them and help them look good on stage. Um, but I'm also a classical musician. So like when you think Los Angeles and music industry, that's really not quite the same thing. Um, although there's plenty of crossover. And then, um, so I took piano lessons. I tried to find students. I tried to find gigs. This is every, every non-pop music. <laughs> Sorry, that's... <laughs> That's uh, that's going a step too far, but like every musician who hasn't made it big, that's their story. They have multiple gigs. They have something on the performing side. They have something on the teaching side. Um, if you get really lucky, you get to, uh, you know, you get to go on tour and um, win big international competitions. And that really never happened to me because I wasn't a soloist. Um, so, yeah, I got some really good opportunities. Um, and then later I decided to get my master's degree at California Institute of the Arts, which was one of my favorite phases in life because it was two years of showing up at a place and just playing music, crazy music of all different kinds with all different kinds of people. And I didn't really have to be responsible to anything because the school just provided the whole framework. Um, but then I graduated into... So, okay. So what year was that? No, 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 no. I, I love all this. So, so you, you really try hard to break through the, the industry. And a lot of people do, you know, you hear about this with musicians and artists all the time. And, and it sounds like you, you tried that for a couple of years and then decided now to go back to school to get a master's in music. So 
no, what year are we talking now? We must be talking about 2006? Yeah, 2007, yeah. 2007. So you, you decide to go back and get your master's. Now, are you getting your master's now because you think you want to go and teach? Or are you doing this? Like, why, like, why get your master's? What was the... And I'm, and I'm really happy that you had these two years of just an amazing experience because I see your face light up <laughs> when, we, when we think about those two years. But what was it that you initially thought the master's would give you? Um, I wanted connections, basically, more experience, um, more connections. I wanted to hopefully see if I could just find uh, you know, more credibility, too, um, because uh, the University of Oregon has a really good general program, um, but this is different. Now we're talking California Institute of the Arts, which is one of the best arts, like most most highly regarded art schools in the nation. They, um, a lot of the Disney artists uh, come from there. Um, the school itself is founded by the Disneys. Um, it's, yeah. Uh, so I, I was, I also got, a nice scholarship to go. So <laughs> that made the decision relatively easy. Um, Did you have to try out? Was there like a... Oh, hell yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you earned that. Like, like not everybody can get in. I mean, you must... I want to see you play piano one day. I, I, I want to see Adol. We're going to get you one of these uh, places. Yell, Guinevere. Because, I mean, right. Like that, not everybody can get into that school. You got into that school. Yeah, it was, it was, I prepared. I, I took a lot of lessons. I, I practiced really hard, you know, I did all the things. Um, and, and, and it was, it was really, really great. But then it was 2008 and then 2009 and the financial collapse happened and uh, the term millennial was coined. And I basically graduated into some of the worst economy in a while. So a lot of opportunity just kind of dried up. And so um, I felt good for having done it, though. I felt better about my own skills. I felt, um, but one of the things that I didn't, wasn't good at getting out of the program was connections. I did I was not good at networking and it was really not until I joined tech and got some really hands-on mentorship and sponsorship that I realized what I should have looked for and who I should have paid attention to back then while I was in music. I thought it was all about like getting good. <laughs> getting as good as possible at my craft. And I was surprised and dismayed to find that A, that was really hard, and B, I mean, let's, let's be real here. In, in music, you're not measured by like, can you do it? But like, how many points above awesome can you do it? Like, it's really, really competitive. So, uh, so I was dismayed to find that it was hard. And I was also dismayed to find that it didn't really seem to matter um, so much on whether I could play that piece perfectly or not. And maybe I was focusing on the wrong things. I still regret to this day that there was one of the professors who took a really personal interest in me and I just never recognized it and just kind of blew it off. So that's, that's on me. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, I'm going to, I want to get back to that because we're going to graduate into, into this 2008 economy, but you, you know, I have similar things. You can always look back later on and say, man, I, sh I it, but some of it's not fair because you didn't have people around you that were also able to help guide you. Like that's not, you don't, you're not born with that knowledge. You have to, yep. you have to learn it. Right. And so right. I, I won't, beat myself up anymore for these things because it wasn't fair. It wasn't, I could not have known that at the time with where I was. And, the, and I want you to like, for me, you should feel the same way, but you got there and this is good. We're going to talk about that with your tech real quick. And I remember the 2008 collapse because I lost my first business thanks to that, you know? And, and I was in, I was 
tech stuff. So it's interesting to me to hear how somebody who's not in tech was also severely affected by that 2008 mortgage. Wow. Okay. So you got your master's, you got the education, you, you've upped your skills in music. You didn't get the connections that you, at the time you felt you wanted. It's easy to look back now. So what are you going to do now in 2008? You have to earn an income. Jobs are scarce. What do you do? Yeah, so I hung out in Los Angeles for another year and, um, you know, created my own gigs, uh, kept teaching lessons. Um, it, And then after my partner at the time graduated uh, from, like, finished, finished his education, uh, we moved to Seattle which we had both wanted. Um, we both did not really enjoy being in Los Angeles. Um, it's too hot there. Um, just, just that's, that's like the big thing right there. It's too hot. Um, <laughs> there's no seasons and it's too hot. Uh, <laughs> so we, we wanted to move to the Pacific Northwest um, and uh, moved to Seattle in 2010. And then I had, we had a kid and I started, uh, I got, I actually got a really, uh, I got fairly successful. I got a job um, being a staff vocal coach for, oh gosh, now the name drops me, for a local college. Um, and, um, and that was awesome. And it also paid $20 an hour. And... I worked roughly 10 hours a week on two or three different days with holes in my schedule of hours that were not billable. Mm. And so the job was great, like when I was working, but everything else around it was terrible. The pay was bad. The, the, the organization, like the scheduling was terrible. The parking was bad. (laughs) I mean, the instruments were not the best. It just, ah. Um, A lot, it sounds like a lot of frustration with your schedule, with everything related to, but when you were there doing the vocal teaching, I think you, I got a sense that that was nice. That was good. You were helping people. It was great. I loved working with these young singers and accompanying them and helping them pronounce their German and their French and um, just discover new music. And it, it really helped build my confidence. It helped build uh, just, yeah, it was, it, was, it was great. And I really wish I could have continued, but it just was not feasible. Just, just from a financial standpoint, it just wasn't so... Um, so let's jump. We've got like 20 plus minutes left and I want to get into the tech side. So, so I think we're really close now, right? So, so what happens between then and then you starting to become a software developer? Like, like, tell me about that transition. How did that happen? Um, there's a bunch of reasons and I won't be able to talk about all of them. And I want to preface this by saying that I tend to focus on different reasons at different times when I talk about this. So um, if you've heard me talk about it in the past, um, I may have focused on a different aspect. Um, But so I'm in music. I am starting to build a really big um, piano teaching studio because that is where the solid income is. And I love teaching the kids. And Ultimately, I realized that most of my stable income came from my piano studio and I had to work really hard to make it happen. And it's, it's a feasible business. It's a one person business. And then I realized it's, it's a job. Like it's a job. It's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to perform and I wanted that to be my job. And most of my time is going into running this business, which is fine, but also 
I have to hustle for everything myself. I have to hustle for students. I have to do my own accounting. I mean, if you've run a business, you know what it's like to file taxes as a sole business owner. Um, I have to... um, I have to follow up on clients. I have to, and I have to start working at 3.30 in the afternoon because that's when the kids are home from school. And I have a little two-year-old who, like, doesn't have afternoon playgroup or anything of the sort. And due to multiple circumstances, when kiddo was three, um... I uh, separated it from his dad. And um, so now I'm trying to run all of this um, by myself. And I want to also spend time with my kid who's at preschool in the mornings, but only home in the afternoons. And so I was just like, you know, if I keep this up, I'm going to miss my kid. Like, you know, I already have to miss half my kid's life because of residency schedules uh, with his dad. I don't I don't want to miss the rest of it because I'm at work (laughs) and I'm in Seattle. A lot of my friends are software engineers. And so I uh, we and they talk a lot about software because they're all like in their mid 20s. They're on their first software job. They talk about linked lists all the time. Um, uh, sorry, everyone. I know you're not just talking about linked lists, but that's what it sounded like at the time. <laughs> and so I said, listen, if you're going to talk about tech all the time, you're going to have to explain to me what you're talking about. And that's when one of them said, Hey, I'm happy to teach you some Python. And, uh, so yeah, we actually did a trade. I, uh, played music with him and he taught me Python. It was great. That's awesome. Okay. Well, you know, I have one question before that. How did these people become your friends? Did you know them from the past? Like, how does a musician of your caliber end up having friends or software developers? So, oh, this is <laughs> this is where it gets crazy. And um, <laughs> good job finding this. I don't think I've ever talked about this very much. Um, when I lived in Los Angeles, I desperately needed a hobby. And I uh, joined a... <laughs> I, uh, my partner at the time suggested, hey, why don't we do ballroom dancing? And I said, I have flashbacks from being an ungainly uh, five foot ten tall teenager trying to do ballroom. And they made me do the lead role. And I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Um, and then he said, well, there's this class called Scottish Country Dancing that is <laughs> offered and like, And I'm like, that sounds even hokier. Um, Let's see. But at the time I felt bad. I said, you know, he's really trying to make me feel better. I should probably go and um, just, you know, just try it out to humor him. So we show up at class. The instructor is wearing a full Scottish kilt. (laughs) And it was really fun. And I said, we're coming back. (laughs) And... um, So it turns out the Scottish country dancing community is an international community uh, that has classes and events all over the world. So when I moved to Seattle, I continued Scottish country dancing. Um, I have gone and spent, you know, you'd call it a conference, but it's really more of a like workshop, like, and I've gone to international workshops and like summer camps, summer camp style doing Scottish country dancing. You can actually search for me on YouTube and I will probably be in some dance videos. Oh, oh weird. Uh, uh, Eric, Eric, we need to record. Yeah, start writing that down. You are amazing, Gwyneth. This is amazing. So so you meet, I'm going to just because of time. So you've met this group of people, Scottish. What is it? Scottish dancing. Country dancing. Country. I want to say country. Not Scottish like dancing, but share some elements. So long story short, the type of dancing that this is appeals to people who love rules and patterns and are um, and, and, and do better when the social situation is clearly laid out, when there's clear expectations on what to do next. So it attracts mostly engineers and librarians, and I'm not making this up. Wow. 
wow, I've never even heard of this. So there's this, so there's a, I guess a local group already in Seattle. Yep. Who mostly made, made up of engineers. Yep. And you become friends with them. So you never thought that Scottish country dancing would, would bring you. So everybody listening, you know, immediately go out for lessons dancing because you never know. <laughs> That's amazing. So now you've got these friends in tech and you start trading uh, your teaching of music and they're starting to teach you program. But I have to imagine that this isn't full time, right? Like this is, no. it starts <laughs> out. Fine. Okay. So how do how, so let's accelerate this. When, when does it, when does it say in your head, okay, I need to learn this so I can be a professional so I can get a job. Like when does that transition happen? And what year are we talking now? We must be talking about 11, 2011, 2012. Uh, more like 2015. 15. Okay, perfect. Yep. So let's talk about that. How do you decide that I'm going to go hedge down? Because if you're still managing your own business and you're still having to bring income in, and then you've got to go hedge down learning tech. This is with young children. This is crazy, right? Like this is, this is a balancing act of all balancing acts. Yeah. So I was at a party where one of my friends was moving away from Seattle and one of the other people said, hey, I heard about this program called Ada Developers Academy. And they are for, at least at the time, they are for training uh, women to join tech as a second career. So they're specifically focused at adults who perhaps missed out on the tech train um, because of, you know, longstanding barriers against um, women to join tech. They have, the uh, Ada Developers Academy has been very successful. They have gone through, they have gone and expanded uh, their program and their target audience as well. It is still an adult only school. They are focusing on underrepresented minorities in tech and adding them into the industry one at a time. They are based in Seattle. Um, there were three things about it that made me want to join. One, again, the networking. They seemed well established and well regarded by the time I heard about it. Two, um, if you're able to join the program, you don't pay tuition. And three, it's a year-long program, so you actually will gain a lot of, you will learn a lot, and you have time to learn a lot. And half of the year is a professional internship. So five months spent at a company working as, like, as an intern, as, as an almost full employee, uh, where you gain experience and connections that, you know, aren't your teachers who basically have to say you're good because, you know, they're your teachers. Uh, <laughs> but this is a full-time program. Yep, it is. So how are you earning income while you're going to school and interning full-time? Uh, I didn't. <laughs> I uh, dug into my savings and um, I had not insignificant help from my parents, which... There's there's more to it than that, but let's just leave it at that for now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so no, that's good. So you were able to basically take a year and really ch change the direction of your professional career. And this school sounds like really prepared you. What were the core things the school was teaching? Was it software development? What technologies were were you learning there in 2015? This, this is 2016 because it actually took me three tries to get in. <laughs> and um, so I took some community college classes as a warm up because I was like, well, maybe I just need to get better at this faster. Um, so I love that. I love that. You applied and they said, no, you're not really ready yet. You're not going to be successful. You went and took some classes. You're like, no, no, I'm going to do this. And you buckled down. I imagine your friends helped. Yes. I also, at the, um, by that point I had, um, no, not that year, but when I started the program, uh, two of my friends moved in as my roommates into my house and 
uh, it really it helped with the bills and it helped with the child care and it helped with the with everything. It was again, it was a magical time. And I'm so glad that I got to have that experience with them. Uh, shout out to Russ and Adriana. They are amazing at being roommates. Um, and yeah, it was uh, it was really cool. Uh, but yeah, I am. Um, I love that. I love that because I tell people all the time, you can't do it alone. I Sometimes my kids are like, I want to do it on my own. I go, you can't. I, I don't don't even want to try. If people are here to help you, take the help. It's not a sign of weakness, right? And I think the more you realize that, the more you realize you have to be there for others too. You have to turn around and help others. And you can do that right now. You don't have to wait to be mentored. You can just turn around and share. Because if someone's mentoring you, there is no reason that you can't like extend what you learn to others like immediately, right away. One of the great things about the ADA program was that they really focused on collaboration. Um, we didn't have tests. We had, we, sure, we had assessments, but we were encouraged to ask our peers first. Um, you know, well, we were encouraged to Google everything first and then ask our classmates and then ask the teachers and teaching assistants. Um, just, just to foster that spirit of collaboration where none of us is going to succeed at this alone. Um, and I really love that they buckled down on that. Um, just, they taught us, uh, each week was kind of in a scrum fashion, almost a little bit. We had like one topic per week and we had to finish it at the end of the week. And then there was a retrospective and there was homework and it was hard. Um, but it was also, you know, very, very val valuable. And um, and it was good to, to have. Once I arrived at the program, I wasn't worried anymore because I knew I I knew that everyone wanted me to succeed. And that was never a feeling that I had gotten in music. In music, I had gotten the feeling that I was competing with my teachers, with my potential mentors um, sometimes. And now I was like, no, everyone here wants me to succeed because it makes them look good and it makes them feel good too. I asked my teacher... Uh, my class teacher, hey, you know, how he was actually, it was his first time teaching the program too. So it was a new job for him. And I said, hey, how do you feel like, you know, moving from like messing around with the kernel at like EMC Isilon uh, to like doing this, walking into a room of, you know, 24 women and non-binary folks who are probably all older than you and teaching them. And he said, you know, this is the best career choice I ever made. I, I love it. I love seeing this. Um, anyway, I went on a ramble there. <laughs> no, no, no. I love that. So you are interning for the five months. What tech are you working? Because it sounds like this is a very practical education you got. You were ready to be in industry the, the moment you left there, which is fantastic. But what were you doing in the internship? Were you, you were writing code? Like, what did they have you doing there? <laughs> so this was really funny. The... Um, the program at Ada at the time, the stack was uh, Ruby on Rails, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, and we also learned how to, you know, how Scrum works and how Git works. Um, all the entire curriculum is on GitHub, so we had to do Git. Um, so, which which is important later. <laughs> uh, and most of us got more um, full stack front endy internships, and I had a little bit of a dispute with my teacher about the time we spent on CSS because I, I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't. So I did the absolute minimum that I could for each website project that we built. And Eric, my designer is laughing so hard right now because he's having flashbacks of Bill <laughs> just doing the same thing. Cause Bill hates it so much. <laughs> yeah, I just, I was just like, this, this is simple, but clean. People can find the right link to click, right? 
And so one of my projects came back with a comment and being like, we really need to see more CSS from you. Look, so um, the next project I got done a day early and we could always like have like extra challenges or, you know, add a model or two or add some functionality. And instead of functionality, I decided to prove him wrong. And I sat down and I made the best design and CSS that I possibly could. And I spent all day on it and I made it look really nice and I tweaked it and, uh, and I ran it through the accessibility tools and all that stuff. And I handed it in and he came back and I said, thank you. Thank you so much for spending extra time on a good, uh, on a good, on the good visuals. And then he never bothered me about it again. Nice. Um, I thought you were going to say, and the first thing out of his mouth was a critique, which is why I hate front end because you spend all that time and nobody has anything positive to say about it ever. <laughs> no, no, he was actually really good. And the best thing that happened was that when it came time to assign people to internships, um, he remembered all of this and my preferences and decided to send me into like the one internship that had almost nothing in common with like full stack web development. I um, was sent to the cloud native computing team together with my fabulous co-intern, uh, Jenny Capote Diaz. Uh, they took both of us so that we would be able to be buddies, um, which was also wonderful. And, um, yeah, Bob Wise was running the team at the time and was really interested in the program and offered uh, four students from Ada an opportunity to be interns there. Uh, and we were numbers three and four. And my teacher placed me there remembering how much I liked for stuff to work and didn't care as much about what it looked like. <laughs> so, so I show up at my internship and they're like, here, spin up a Kubernetes cluster. And I said, Cooper, what? <laughs> nice. But that was a fantastic opportunity. I mean, yes. yeah, I mean, really yeah, out. yeah, yeah, that was, that was great. The people you must have met there, the tech that you were working on really leads you to, okay, because we got about five minutes left here. So, so eight minutes left. So, so I just want to jump there. So you got this amazing internship. In fact, I want to I want to intern there for for 6 months too to be honest with you. <laughs> um tell me and I know you said you had another job in between, but I I really want to spend the last 8 minutes here in, in GitHub, which must have been surreal when you've been studying Git and working with Git and GitHub this whole time and suddenly it's like, "Hey, you want to go work over there?" It would be like, "What?" So kind of tell me how the how you got to GitHub. Just because within, you know, we've got eight minutes left. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's, it's actually, it, my internship turned into a full-time job. Um, so it's actually the same job. I just continue doing the same thing, except this time I got paid more than a stipend. Um, <laughs> a lot more than a stipend. Um, and uh, I stayed at the cloud native computing team and started contributing uh, to Kubernetes um, in their, basically, you know, I helped out a lot with like, hi, I'm new to Kubernetes, where do I start? Uh, that kind of space. And it was a lot of people oriented and I got to like take my old teaching skills and apply them to a new field, which was cool. Um, turns out it's a lot easier to teach technologically savvy adults about tech than it is to teach five-year-olds how to play a Bach minuet. So, you know, um, but uh, after a year, the focus had shifted and I wasn't, and a lot of, yeah, anyway, a lot of stuff happened um, and I started just looking around for new opportunities and uh, then I was like uh, Sydney Miller, who I had met at KubeCon in Austin, reached out to me and said, hey, I know last time we chatted, you didn't really want to work on a remote team because you're new to the industry and all this. But like, uh, are you, you know, are you rethinking this? We're hiring. And I said, oh, OK, I guess I guess it can't hurt to try. And um 
so I, I interviewed, I got interviewed by some real scary people. Um, uh, scary because I knew them from like their public Twitter accounts and things like that. And, um, but I also, it, Basically, the team said, the team said, hi, we run the Kubernetes infrastructure at GitHub. We want a person who is familiar with the upstream community. We want, we think that you bring a lot of value to this team and we want you to continue to contributing what you have been doing and also, you know, work on the actual clusters and work on the platform that like trans, like abstracts a lot of the cluster uh, functionalities and um, and I thought that sounded amazing and like a total dream job. And every time I talked to anybody from that team, I wanted the job more. Um, I started talking to the, uh, to the hiring manager. So the manager, the, my future manager, uh, Kelsey, uh, Gilmore Innes. Um, and one of the things that she did that has nothing to do with tech was that she was incredibly upfront with all of the benefits that were available to uh, people at GitHub. And one of the things that she did was she just volunteered. She says, we have, uh, we have comprehensive parental leave policies. And the great thing about that was this way I didn't have to ask and she didn't have to guess about any kind of plan like that. It feels like an incredibly Sorry, I just kind of feel like I have to put this in there. It just made me feel awesome about this person. It, it, it sent me a signal that this manager cares about the complicated relationship between the manager and the employee, right? Like, it's like this awkward situation of a, as a woman in tech in a job interview, do I ask, hey, what's your parental leave like? Right? Because everyone I ask this question, like, they're going to draw conclusions. And if you just go ahead and volunteer this information to anybody, then this is never an issue ever. It's, it, it was great. But, you know, also what the team was working on sounded incredibly fun. And I really liked everyone I met. And I was convinced I wasn't going to get it. I spent all summer. Um, it was kind of a slow interview process. So, <laughs> and yeah. And then they made me the offer and I accepted it. it and what year was that? You, you started working there in 17? Oh, uh, no, 18. 18, 18. Fall 18. of 18, yeah, September okay. 2018. So I've been there two and a half years now. So the choice to go back to school, uh, and the school you went to, Ada, right? So it was yeah. Ada, yeah. was, what sounds, I mean, that was life-changing. I, like, I'm really impressed with that, what that school was able to do for you. I mean, they literally delivered on, on not just getting employment, but a career in high tech. Yep. Yeah. I just, I, I don't, I, I don't know how to say it more. Um, but it, I was really scared when I got my acceptance letter. I said, Oh no, now, now it became real. It wasn't real before. Um, and it became more real than I ever expected. It's, it's been not without challenges, but I have so far been incredibly lucky and <laughs> and everyone always asks me isn't tech really toxic and I I guess maybe for some people but I can be really I a lot of those people haven't been in the music industry before <laughs> <laughs> so a couple more things before we're done I got a couple more minutes are you still playing music you still looking for and finding time and opportunity to to play your music so yes and no <laughs> i don't have the time to continue playing the kind of music with the kind of people that i want because it's so hard um it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of dedication and in tech, I constantly feel, especially as a career changer, I feel like I have to catch up. I have to learn new things all the time. Um, you know, imposter syndrome is a thing I struggle with uh, a lot. So 
But <laughs> I, uh, I have picked up my violin again, and I have joined a lot of um, like Celtic music sessions, and I play that for fun a lot. I play music with my kid. Um, I play Schubert solo. The one thing I'm really missing, and I wish I had time for, you know, once, once I can like meet people again, is play more chamber music. Um, that that has definitely been missing from my life. Um, it's it's not time right now to do it, but I know that it'll come around to it soon. So one of the things I'm getting from your story, uh, and it's important, I, I try to teach my kids this all the time, and you're like this living example of it, right? Is that um, you could look back and say, well, I had a lot of luck here and I had a lot of luck there, but the reality is you created that luck. And I, I don't want anybody not to see that. Like you worked hard. You went back and, and you didn't pass something. You worked a little harder until you passed. You you made these choices and even if it was a struggle. You knew it was the right thing and, and you and you made it happen. And some of it might feel like luck, but to me, it's not luck. It was you working really, really hard. You made good decisions. I mean, every once in a while we get we make a decision that works out really well. And I think you made a couple with the school, but I, I, the takeaway for me is that, that if you work really hard and you, and you focus on a goal that, that you want, that the, the good decisions aren't good things. I don't know. What do you, what do you think about what I'm saying there or how you feel about that? I feel, I struggle with that a lot um, because it, first of all, it doesn't feel like that when I'm in the middle of it, in the middle of it, I just like, put you know one foot in front of the next right this this seems like the next right thing to do um and i don't want to i don't want this to turn into a in music we were told a lot if you try really hard if you it will happen you just have to want it hard enough and that's just not true that's that's that i don't like that narrative I, I don't because I tried really hard and yeah, maybe I could have tried harder. Maybe I couldn't, but I also didn't get the breaks that I did in tech. I really didn't. Like it was an absolute coincidence that the person I collaborated with at Samsung was a big deal in the Kubernetes community and introduced me to everybody. That was luck for sure. I mean, sure. I also like saw the opportunity for what it was and made good use of it. Of course, right? I, I, I rose to the challenge, but not everyone gets that break. Not in tech. And I see this a lot because I get, I get asked for interviews and I'm a white lady, <laughs> right? I want people who don't look like me to get this kind of amazing opportunity. And um, I want to hand it off and hand it down. And I want your next guest to, you know, uh, to be to be to be someone who doesn't look like me. Right. Um, and I want the next. Yeah. So 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 it's a mix of both. Right. Yes, of course, be responsible for your own actions, but also realize, like you said earlier, it it takes a community. It really, really does. Well, this was an amazing conversation we just had. I, I cannot express enough uh, how grateful I am for you to opening up today and talking about your, your life and your career. And I think it's going to help a lot of people who are maybe in that same kind of path that you were up until now. And I, and I wish you only the really greatest success. And I cannot wait to get to Seattle because we're going to do some Scottish country dancing. I'm going to bring my kilt. And yes! we're going, I'm bringing my kilt. I'm, I'm getting Ian. I'm calling out Ian, some of my other friends in Seattle. <laughs> we're, we're going dancing. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. That's our hour. So I want to thank everyone for spending the last hour with me and Guenadier here at the Arden Labs podcast. See everybody again real soon. Mm -hmm.